So, uh, Eleanor, I'm very grateful to be here, and I'm also grateful that uh, I understood at least 80% of what was said here, because talk about fear and humility, uh, it was kind of a little scary for a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, to walk into a room full of philosophers. A few things, uh, so thanks for letting me be in the ivory tower for a, a day. Um, you know, a few things sort of mitigated my fear. Uh, one is that I've been hanging around this crowd for, what, 50 years at least, something like that. And so I can now even make in-jokes, even though I don't really even understand some of the jokes. So, um, but the other thing is that as I sat and listened, I just heard a lot of psychological stuff that came up. Words like, phrases like self-esteem and motivation and so on. Um, you know, even from the 10th century, uh, hearing about the different faculties, I was very interested in hearing about that because it just seemed to be relevant to something I'm going to say in a minute. And also the view that maybe there are different species, I like species of humans, which I thought was very interesting. The scholars, the prophets, which seem to me to, you know, speak to different dimensions. Uh, so that was, that was kind of comforting. Um, the other thing was, uh, David didn't read this uh, particular thing on his handout, but uh, one of them says, the causes of their debate was differences in their personal traits. This is what the sages meant when they said, these and those are the words of the living God. And it brought to mind a kind of exercise that I used to do when I hung around philosophy conferences and philosophers, which was meeting people and having sort of new, normal human discourse, and then trying to guess what field of philosophy they specialized in. Um, and I was right a lot of the time, wasn't I? <laughs> That's not very normal, but I was. Um, at any rate, uh, just, I, I just really wanted to say a couple of things that came to mind when I looked at this topic or just heard the topic of intellectual humility. Um, I practice clinical psychology. I don't do theoretical research. I work with people every day. I work with veterans, it happens, uh, in Los Angeles. They are a surprisingly varied group uh, because Los Angeles is a very diverse city. Um, I also have a lot of friends who are academics and who often ask me for recommendations for therapists, for themselves, their spouses, their children, whatever. And I have to tell you that academics are some of the most difficult clients. Now, why are they difficult? They are very smart. They are schooled in argument. They uh, are very logical. And they often say to me, I need a therapist who's smarter than me. OK? So, the, and, and I've worked with some, a lot of people who are quite smart and find that what, what we in psychology call raw intelligence or IQ, as it's sort of traditionally known, is not always the best way to, the best vehicle for helping people solve their problems. And yet, it is really difficult to convince somebody whose life is very much uh, taken up by that endeavor, that that's not the case. And that, that really is a challenge and a, um, uh, you know, on the other hand, as a therapist, it would be uh, not uh, 
helpful to me, uh, to the client, to ignore the fact that that's their most useful tool. So that's the struggle and the, you know, the, um, the challenge. Um, in the mid-90s, a man named Daniel Goleman came up with this idea of emotional intelligence. You've probably heard the term. You have probably can picture the book. It was a bestseller for a long time. And um, he, he coined this phrase to talk about a different dimension of intelligence than what all of us felt, you know, IQ was. And he talked about emotional IQ. And then there were all sorts of offshoots of that, social IQ and so on. It's taken quite seriously nowadays, even in the realm of business and leadership and so on. And um, it's actually something that uh, I grew up very intimately with because my mother has probably one of the most high emotional intelligence IQs that I have ever, I, I've ever met a person with that high of a sensitivity. To this, she's 91, and um, just the other day, she really is in cognitive decline. She could not have a discourse with you about almost anything and could almost never problem solve. But we had an interaction with a woman at her facility who was saying something to me, and we walked away, and my mother said to me, I don't like her. She said, she's full of it. And she was right. <laughs> okay. So that's one aspect of, uh, I, I don't know if we want to call it intellectual humility in the sense that taking into account other, what do we call it, dimensions, other intelligences seems to me, it's certainly very important in my work. Um, so that's one thing I just wanted to kind of put on the table or throw out there. The other thing is um, when it, I also work, besides working with individuals who uh, have trauma and so on, one of my specialties is couples therapy. And um, interpersonal dynamics and related to that, like interfaith dialogue or cross-cultural dialogue. I think some people, when they get married, they feel like they married somebody from another culture, even if they weren't. <laughs> and they did, because they came from another family. So it, that's another area that I want to just sort of make a note of before we start the panel, which is um, I, had a, I had a couple come into my office, and, and the uh, I think it was a boyfriend, or the, the uh, male partner, said, I don't understand why we have all these fights. I lay out all the reasons for her, and she just doesn't get it. You know? And this was, you know, this started a whole conversation about the role of reasons in their dynamic. And that was, it was a very important conversation. Um, I think nowadays a big challenge, and, and I think intellectual humility uh, is very relevant in this area, is the interface, interfaith dialogue area and the cross-cultural dialogue area. I mean, the world is becoming smaller and smaller. We are, there are certainly challenges all over the world about cultures needing to live with each other and so on. You know, the Middle East is a great example of that. And the challenge there is, uh, go, I think, runs very, very deep. Um, so best illustrated by a couple of stories. I was actually talking to John about about if you've ever tried to bargain in a Middle Eastern market, you realize how little you know about what drives the other individual. And, you know, that, that's one example. Another example is a story a friend of mine told me about 
living in Japan. Evidently, and I could get this, I could have this wrong, so if anybody knows better, tell me, but evidently in some Asian cultures, saying no is not considered polite. And so she was shopping for little undershirts for her infant child, and she learned how to say this in Japanese, and she went to one department store and asked, you know, do you have any of these undershirts? And the person nodded and said, yes, yes, we do. And so she went into the store and looked all around. There were no undershirts. So she went to a second store. The same scenario happened. And, you know, this became very frustrating to her. I mean, she went home empty-handed. Now, you know, in talking to her about this, we, we both were, you know, it, it, it's a comical story, but on the other hand, you know, you can walk away from an interchange like that saying, how do these people get along? You know, like, how can they live like this? This is ridiculous. You know, either you say yes or you say no. But obviously there was more to it. And obviously they get along just fine. So if we don't attempt to understand those kinds of issues in other cultures, other religions, and so on, we're not even going to get to first base. Now, I don't know how to say what to do with that, but I'm going to end there because, um, but I, I do want to point out the importance of that. So, okay. So, let's start. You guys can start any way you like. But I don't want to start because I uh, spoke last time. I, uh, yeah. I, I, I want to raise an issue that hasn't come up at all. Is that a, a new sure. one? Um, but be, before I raise, raise the issue, issue, I just have still puzzled by something you hear, somebody gets a very laudatory introduction and then they say I'm very humbled by that introduction. I would think it would be quite the opposite, right? <laughs> and very inflated by that introduction. I never quite understood this. Um, I want to just, just, just to raise an issue, I mean I, I guess most people in this room are philosophers. Uh, you know, we, we work in a field in which the, the hallmark of the field is criticism. Um, I think that this is true even more than in other fields. If you look at, look at the number of acknowledgments at the end of an article in philosophy, I mean, it is hilarious sometimes. Then open up, you know, a, a work on history or something like you will not see, you know, you will not see as many. Uh, and of course, there'll be very extensive thank yous at the beginning of the book. Okay, that you get in other fields too, but I'm speaking about uh, in, in, in articles. You know, we thank people for their, uh, uh, for their criticism. Though I did once see uh, a preface. I, I thought I knew who the author was, and I thought it was somebody named Herbert Davidson. I think I was wrong, where it said, I will not engage in the fatuous practice um, of saying that any, uh, any um, uh, mistakes in this book are my responsibility. After all, I spoke to many people about this book, <laughs> and I don't know who told me what. So <laughs> anyway, but that's sort of honest. And, uh, you know, when you think of it, Receiving criticism can be a very humbling experience. Dishing out criticism, you know, there's sometimes this idea you don't want to make the other person feel like, you know, like mincemeat. We're in a field in which the idea is, I don't want you to tell me it's great, right? I want you to tell me that what I have doesn't work or whatever. And, you know, we all know that feeling of just improving and improving uh, through peer review, through, through, through comments uh, uh, by others. And uh, I just think it's a very interesting phenomenon because I don't know if we have this in, um, uh, in, 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 um, in other fields. I'm trying to turn this into some kind of a, uh, a clear question. Also, by the way, if people don't give criticism to other people, then they're thought of as uh, self-involved, right? Uh, uh, you know, um, enough, about, they say, enough about my work, uh, let's talk about you. Let's talk about what you think, you know, of my work. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it has the potential to really be humbling, right? And the potential to really be devastating. And somehow it doesn't work out that way. You know, somehow it's exactly what it's exactly the sort of thing we want. I find this very parallel to Talmud, which I talked about this morning. It's the constant give and take. Uh, the rabbis talk about how when two people study Talmud together, they're fighting each other, they're yelling at each other, and so forth. And then they embrace at the end, you know, like they say, like like lovers from youth. And we all have this experience. I just don't know if I've triggered anybody's thought, thoughts about this, but uh, I just find this idea of please criticize me, you know, 
or, um, uh, or please give me, you know, please criticize me, or please, I want to criticize you, um, is a very central part of the field. What effect does it have on humility? Pride, humility. Did that make any sense? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. when I think of that, I, mean, I always want criticism, but there's criticism and then there's yeah. criticism. Right. Um, and so what I want is the one somebody can be honest with me. Um, Right. Not the one who says, there's absolutely nothing of any scholarly value here whatsoever, one, two, three, four. And it's like, I can answer all of those. Uh, but, um, so no, I agree with you. It's, it, it is interesting. It's, we, it is a profession that thrives on, you know. Being humbled. Uh, on, being, on being humbled, yes. Um, and, uh, I just comments, because, I mean, one of the things that I found interesting uh, and I'm, the only reason I'm not going to you first is because it'll go right back to where we st uh, left the last session because I have a question for you. Um, but when you were talking about within the discussion of the Odyssey, um, and you you mentioned, and I just I really liked it. I had I mean I knew it; it was there, but then just haven't seen the uh, the protest literature. Um, that you know, here's Abraham, uh, you know, fighting with God, and like. You're, it doesn't seem very fair what you're about to do here, um, and it's, I mean, we can oftentimes feel within a religious community that we shouldn't question what's going on in our lives. This is, you know, God has given, uh, this is baby chair or some horrible thing like that. Um, and um, yet it's, it strikes me that if we're human at all, we get upset about these things, and God, why is this? And so the, I guess then, the idea that maybe that is okay um, and it's consistent with humility, or maybe it isn't consistent with humility, but uh, it's not wrong, even if it isn't consistent with humility, struck me as being an interesting point. Maybe that there's this conflict or that they complement each other in interesting it, sorts of ways. Yeah, I, I think that, that last point is really becoming a, uh, has become already a, a sort of flashpoint between continental philosophy and uh, analytic philosophy in a sense. Because um, in continental philosophy, this is idea I mentioned this morning, don't ever ask why, ask what. You have this in Levinas, you have Rabbi Soloveitchik, that the idea is to ask, you know, what you can do meaningfully given the evil rather than trying to figure out why it happened. Try to figure out why it happened. It will, uh, it will prevent you from do anything about it. That's a kind of continental mm -hmm. approach. I think some of this also has gained some um, force after the Holocaust because that's something where people feel that just beggars any kind of explanation. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, but on the other hand, in analytic philosophy, people are still you know, trying to work out things like you know, the soul-making, theodicy, and the like. What, what I've noticed is a trend in recent years in analytic philosophy towards something they call skeptical theism, which is basically an attempt to say, look, we don't really know why, why God does this, except there it's presented as a theodicy, sort yeah. of, like we're still playing the theodicy game. But in truth, it's very close to the, to the, how, to the how continental is it a position. But, how is it? Well, when I say it's a theodicy, what I mean is that it's sort of presented as if we're still in that framework of theodicy. Because here's what I want to show you. I want to show you that your inference from, you know, there's a perfect God. Your inference from there to evil, that inference doesn't work because uh, we don't really know what a being, what sorts of reasons a being of that kind would have. So it, because it's pinned to the argument, mm -hmm. you know, so it's 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 presented as a, um, uh, you know, it's still part of the, the mm -hmm. framework. But I think it's moving over more to the. To the continental approach, and now the question you're raising, which I, I, I wonder about also, is: it, it, Can it really be realistically expected that people aren't going to ask the why question? I mean, the why question is just, you know, it's just such a natural question that we can't, we can't, we can't avoid asking it. And that you see in the prophets, when the yeah. prophets raise yeah. those questions without answers, say, "How? How did it happen? Why did it happen?" But they're not asking for an answer, really. They're yeah. just, you know. Well, it's Jeremiah, I, I know I'm going to be wrong, but... Uh, right, I know, right. So. I know I'm going to lose, but... <laughs> but, but yeah. So, that's, so, so now can I actually uh, pick on you for a second? Yeah. Um, so here's... I, this is a <laughs> oh, question... Sure, yeah, no, no, it's, 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 it's a question I yeah, like. Yeah. Um, so when you were talking about humility, you likened it uh, to being awestruck, to being stunned. And so then I thought about being awestruck, 
it struck me as it's something phenomenologically complex. When I thought about when do I feel awe, and in one case, I, I, I can still remember holding my my first son, newborn, and just being utterly awed. And I think that that was the sense that you were trying to just like, and even now as I think back of it, just mm -hmm. absolutely, ugh. But another sense in which I think I could be awed, and you mentioned the Grand Canyon, or you look out and if you've ever been in a desert, you can look out at the, the, the huge vastness of of uh, the cosmos and everything else, then you feel odd, but you do so precisely because you feel really small. And so, and I'm wondering, and small and low are kind of uh, not synonymous, but I'm wondering if the sense of humility that you're identifying with awestruck might partially be precisely because of a comparison. A compare, well, I mean, as I said, because it's complex. Um, so, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's right, but it just it what seems interesting right off the bat is um, not so quickly putting all this stuff together in one bag mm -hmm. and thinking right. that um, the feeling you have holding a baby and the feeling you have listening to the Ninth Symphony mm -hmm. might be interestingly different. Right. Um, that's really interesting, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to say exactly, but I agree. It's, it might well be different. And um, You know, if you picture somebody, the movie Gravity that I didn't like so much, but um, you know, if you picture yourself there, you're going to feel small. Out, you're in outer right. space somewhere, oh, and you're looking at I the haven't whole, seen it, I you're looking at the cosmos <laughs> in three dimensions, something, mm -hmm. you know, and things are flying by you, and you're going to feel small. Now, what role that smallness plays, I'm not sure exactly, mm -hmm. um, but you're not necessarily going to feel small when you hear the Ninth Symphony, and you're not necessarily going to feel small when you hold the baby. No, no, that's what I, uh, that's, yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with you. That's I'm not disagreeing. You, do you, do you yeah. feel small, I mean, one, one time I feel really small, when you realize the number of people in this world, um, you hear that there's 70,000 yeah. people at, the, at, a, at a ball game. You yeah. hear, then you hear about, you know, the 200 million people doing this and that. And, and you realize how many people there are uh, in this world. You go on an airplane and you're amazed that there are 500 people going to Denver. And sit on the plane, whatever. <laughs> it feels like 500. Um, the, uh, uh, how many people are going on the airplane to where you're going? Yeah, and it right. makes you realize how many people there are in the world. And I, I, I find it overwhelming. I also find it overwhelming how many books there are in, 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 in the world. I mean, it was just you. And how many unread ones are in my I can't library? get my arms so. around this world. It's just. Yeah, yeah. yeah. good. Mm -hmm. you, know, good. You, know, you know, people have questions. I'm going to open it up to the floor here. But I wonder if you could just say one word, maybe, each of you, just one word. See, part of what this day was supposed to help us all think about is how the three major monotheisms differ from one another on this score. So that as this project on intellectual humility goes forward, we have maybe some deepened awareness of the fact that not all these uh, traditions speak exactly with the same voice. I wonder if you want to say a word on that score before we open the floor. Yeah, uh, the woman who is a new faculty member in your department? Catherine. Catherine. So she helped me see that, I think, that um, perhaps the difference that I'm, the, the, the point that I was making about um, humility without less than came from my own perspective, which isn't Christian. So that's a place that you might, right, S see this, that um, to the extent that you think of us as sort of stained originally, you may, that may get built into this in a way that it wasn't for me. So that's, that, that's responsive to this point, I think. That would certainly be true of Islam as well. Which way? Uh -huh. In the way, more in the way that you, in, in agreement with you, that um, it's, it's, I mean, the very fact that it doesn't even need to show up in the Quran as being something that needs to be discussed, 
Um, and at least in the medieval tradition, the, the very idea that humility requires that you be in a state of, you know, a superior state to those with whom you're responding. Um, not, sure uh, which, not always, but... Uh, which way you mean it? So, um, is Islam more like Christianity that way? Or more no, like I think it's less like Christianity in that way. So, I mean, um, there's an emphasis, it's, it strikes me that there's an emphasis on lowering oneself, and that is not what the view is in Islam. It's literally um, about being in a state of, you know, superior state, so that, well, at least for Avicenna, so that you can help others. And so it's not about lowering oneself at all, but actually lifting somebody else up. So, I mean, I'm not saying that that's opposed to what's going on in Christianity, but it is, it, the idea of being low is not emphasized in the same sort of way. Or if it is, it only when you introduce the notion of God himself or itself. One more thing about this. Um, one thing that came through from today very clearly for me um, is this mensch business about to what extent yeah. All is not a mensch. you think of God in very human terms and the paradox of the fact that you have the incarnation in Christianity, but somehow the transcendent properties are the ones that get a lot of play. They do in me, and David said this before, they do in medieval Judaism, as well, medieval philosophical work. And that's odd to me. I never understood it, kind of, because I once, yeah. David Hartman, the late David Hartman, who was uh, a, a philosopher and a rabbi in Jerusalem, gave a talk, gave us a, a, um, a course at UCLA on uh, on Maimonides, it was several courses he gave. Actually, here's a funny story. He uh, he was told he had, he's a very he was a very disorganized and creative person, and he was told he had to have a syllabus. He said, to "What a, a <laughs> syllabus? Like with a reading list and a plan? This was kind of crazy. He couldn't believe that that was true. So he went home and he prepared a syllabus, and it was like the book list was like five pages long. So people went crazy. They thought they had to buy all these books. He said, no, you don't have to do that, but." You guys don't appreciate the purpose of a Jewish library. You're supposed to walk into the room and feel guilty, <laughs> <laughs> um, right? But but so he gave this course on Maimonides, and when I took in, the, I had read stuff, but not so fully. And when I took in the picture he had of Maimonides, which is to emphasize what you call the transcendent properties, the only properties, and um, the project of, of the major work, Guide for the Perplexed, is a kind of, well, at least a big part of it is a purification project to show you how biblical language um, is anthropomorphic, but that's just surface level. It's not the way we really think. Um, so my reaction was, what does he do at the Midrash? This whole literature of talking about God in the most human and and he just said to me, it's a, uh, a different religious sensibility, which was a very good comment. It got me thinking about the concept of religious ses sensibility, which is not, I mean, you could be in the room, in the same church, with people with very different sensibilities in this sense. Yeah. Um, I, I would pull out, I didn't want to make so much of an explicit, explicit comparison, uh, because I just don't want to express more confidence and want to be more humble about what the other traditions say. But I, I, I jotted down in response to this question a couple of things about Judaism that I think are, are sort of distinctive. Um, one came up this morning, and that's the question of the protest literature, which uh, Eleanor, re I had related this to, to the fact that the protest literature that is coming out of, you know, out of a good place, out of empathy, out of concern with the people, Eleanor raised, raised the point, which I think holds true, that, that this coheres very well with the general rabbinic tradition, which is to view God as a person. And people get into debates because it's much more of, of an interaction between persons. I think that that is one that, that's a, uh, that could be a distinctive uh, uh, aspect of, uh, of Judaism. A second thing, I think, which may not be that distinctive, is the emphasis on, on dialectic. You know, how you always, uh, you had this story you like to tell about, that story, you quote Rav Nachman of Bratzlav. In one hand, you should have a piece of paper that says, I am dust and ashes, and in the other, you have made, made human being 
a little bit less than the gods, right? Then you hold them at the same time. There's a lot of that, and the clashing sensibilities you are mentioned. Many people navigate by means of this, you know, of this kind of uh, of, of this kind of dialectic. Um, another thing that I think is uh, very salient in Judaism is this interpretive pluralism, and I think it needs to be understood why. That's why why pluralism exists because they wanted a psychological explanation, and Barbara quoted that explanation. That different people are different. They come in. You come into any intellectual matter with your own, um, you know, with your own psychological baggage. That's the theme. So it's it's not just that, that it favors in, in, interpretive pluralism. It's to try to understand why is there so much controversy. Um, I think the whole emphasis in Judaism on the value of controversy called Machaloket. I mean, this is the lifeblood of the people. As I said, you preserve minority opinions, and we go back to it, and we revisit, and we, we argue in the way you study Talmud with my brother-in-law probably is to argue flat with him, too. Yes. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and what's only related to this is also the role of argument in, 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 in Jewish tradition, or in this particular kind of tradition, but as a way of bonding with people. That, that's what's amazing. There are several sources that talk about this. How, I mean, it happens, one thing I, I noticed is that in the uh, tractate Avot, which is called Ethics of the Fathers, there is one Mishnah, in other words, one, one unit, that, that, that says that any controversy which is for the sake of heaven is going to endure. Then the next one talks about any love which is, you know, ulteriorly motivated will not last. And I wondered, why are these put side by side? They seem so different. I think it's because they recognized that the culture of controversy can also generate, you know, the culture of ill feeling and, and, and people disliking each other. And it's a way of saying that, no, on the contrary, you're supposed to, uh, uh, bond, uh, you're supposed to bond through this. I mean, through all this, there's authority, there's precedent, there's bowing to precedent, and yet this controversy and in interpretive pluralism is very central. There's a beautiful story in the Talmud about um, a, a teacher, uh, Rabbi Yochanan, whose student died, and he, he just like, couldn't, like, he couldn't teach anymore because this student used to challenge him, you know, with 24 objections on anything that he said. So after that student died, another student came, and this other student kept agreeing with everything he said. He says, I can't take it. <laughs> I can't take it. This is like philosophers. <laughs> I, I think philosophy and Talmud go together. Am I right? Now we, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've always been attracted. I think I've been attracted to both for exactly the same reasons. <laughs> but uh, I think those are the distinctive, those are distinctive to, to Judaism. Oh, they're salient in Judaism, and as far as making the comparisons to other religions, I would have to leave that to the experts in that. I went in college um, studying Talmud in a large room, like the next room over here, which is a large room. It'd be like a hundred guys sitting in the room at small tables, two or three together, screaming at each other. And my father once picked me up, and he didn't know about this stuff. And he walked in and he thought, what the hell is going on here? These guys screaming at each other. And uh, there's a lot of love. <laughs> it's very interesting. It really is. They scream at the top. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. You can learn. You can Very often people have lifelong chabruta. The chabruta is your study partner. You can be with, you can study, come people who have the same partner for 50, for 50 years. They come to learn, they come to study together. They're sitting in the dining room, you hear screaming. You probably have this, right, Josh? Yeah. That's, that's, that's what we do. So maybe we should open it yeah. down to the, uh, to the audience. Barbara, I want to see what you want to do. Sure. This question is for each of you. Um, so, in the Psalms uh, 11 4, on one of the numberings, it says uh, something like, With pride comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. And so, I'm wondering if each of you could weigh in on why you might think it the case that humility can lead to wisdom. Not, not assume it, right? Like some of the maybe, um, maybe out of sentence view, you require to experience wisdom. But, and maybe, maybe that's true, but then money could lead to the further acquisition. Well, I mean, for all of the fellows that I read, uh, humility involves some sort of self-reflection and self-assessment. And so if you take wisdom to be sort of a deeper understanding, maybe a deeper understanding of yourself and then how to respond, then 
in as much as wisdom does involve uh, self-reflection for these guys, it would lead to a wisdom. So that would be, I guess, my comment there. So I was thinking, really, in a different way, where self-reflection is not at the heart of the game. Now, am I supposed to yell really loud, you're wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and it yeah, has to do with first. <laughs> it has to do with, uh, in a way, your ability to hold on to what you think and at the same time not give it too big a role as obviously true or to, to be able to listen and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, but that's part of self-assessment, right? It doesn't have to be. It can be. It doesn't. I mean, in other words, I may give, th I, my wife might say to me, you know, uh, you, you said that a little strong. <laughs> so I have to assess myself. I have to think about it. But um, the virtue is not self-assessment. I mean, the virtue I'm talking about, I'm not, yeah. you know, we're talking about different virtues in a way, yeah. maybe. The virtue I'm talking about is not essentially self-assessing so much as other directed, right? It's other directed and uh, how that might lead to wisdom is, you know, easy to see because if you're too self-contained with your own ways and thoughts and values, you're not hearing, you're not hearing the other guy. I was once on a, pan I was once on a panel at my school and um, there were two speakers that were sent from Israel one a Palestinian woman and a Jewish guy, and um, they kind of agreed on stuff, but the panel didn't agree on, on things. The panel was a, it was a Catholic woman who, who was, I mean, I agreed with everything she said, I think. And then there was, there were two Palestinian American professors and I think American Jews are nuts about Israel by and large, but I think Palestinian Americans are probably nuts about it as well. Somehow you feel like you've got to defend the homeland when you're outside. And uh, so these guys said very strong things uh, comparing Israel to Nazis and stuff. And I was get you know, I was like, so um, I was supposed to go in the middle of them and the pastor who was running the show let me go suggested I go last because he wanted me to be able to respond to both of them. And uh, I thought it was an occasion to talk about the virtue of listening to the other guy and that the minute you call somebody a Nazi, the game's over, right? No one's listening to anybody. And that the central kind of moral um, obligation, uh, it's not the right word for it, but the central moral thing for me was to be able to hear. You don't have to agree, but you have to hear. And uh, so I said, I made a big pitch for this, and then the students were able to ask questions, and all the questions were just talking points on both sides. It had nothing to do with anything I, you know, wanted to hear. I didn't want to hear talking points. I wanted to hear people exploring and struggling, kind of, yeah. So, can I and please jump, in. jump in, even as the moderator? Yeah, yeah, okay. of course. Um, you know, what you, when you pair, talk about wisdom and humility, I, I don't know exactly how to tie this up, but I, I thought about, one of you brought up uh, the humbling activity of trying to read God's mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I work with human beings, I sometimes feel like that's the endeavor, trying to read God's mind. <laughs> and it is a mean? very humbling experience. Why God's mind? People made in the image of God. I don't know, uh, it just uh, or the complexity uh, of it, or the, you know, something. I mean, that's what jumped to my mind when mm -hmm. somebody, I think David, somebody used that mm -hmm. phrase. Yeah. And uh, it, when you, when I or other psychologists try to make predictions about who's going to succeed or who's going to do well or who's not going to do well or whatever, we're often humbled and it informs our work in the future. So I don't know how to tie that together, but that's what I thought of for you. It's a different kind of wisdom, I guess. Yeah, I had, I had another thought about the, the wisdom thing. It, se it, it, it seems like there are two two different kinds of humble people, in a way. I mean, there's the type of humble person who's just sort of like naturally humble, humble and didn't get there by thinking about anything. 
Then there's the type who's been very, very introspective, asking questions like, you know, what have I achieved? What, I, what haven't I achieved? What are my abilities? Where, where am I lacking? Other people, how are they doing in life? You know, what, what sorts of talents do they have? Uh, you know, learn how to navigate the world that way. It's, it's an acquired, that kind of humility seems to be an acquired humility that comes out of self-reflection. So I don't know whether the sort of unconscious humility where you really haven't you know, thought things through at all, if that leads to wisdom, but it seems that the other kind is a kind of wisdom. And then, you know, I would just add also what Howie said, which was that the, the ability uh, to learn from others. I mean, in a way, humility is a kind of reality check, right, I mean, in, in, in certain ways. And it's about yourself. It's a little bit like Googling yourself, you know, you sort of find out what life is been like, what you can see. Yeah, something like that, which I'm sure no, I'm sure everybody no, no, nobody nobody does. that, no. <laughs> You're, you're a therapist. I, I think they answer the question of wisdom. First of all, does plug in. I think, I give my two cents on it, I'm going to follow in the sense of um, the room of water, which is a sense of creatureliness, and that's that confluence between, between the little less than the angels or the gods that. and the dust. It's, it's actually aware of both your genius and your radical limitation. But where the wisdom, I think, comes that what that leads to, I think, is the willingness to allow your mind not to be absolutely dominant, only relatively dominant. And I think you're, you're what you do, the therapist, you have to listen. They can't listen merely analytically, you're wasting your time, wasting their money. You have to listen to some affection. Because it's the only way you bond. The wisdom is in the bond. Paradoxically, it's my opinion, and my experience, frankly, is the truth is felt before it's understood. For philosophers, it's extremely difficult because we make a living out of arguing. Arguing isn't the same thing. You don't argue with your patients. Try not. Short cut, low <laughs> that was the guy who was in the a girl from an LSU class. He said, I got all these reasons. He might be tough to that wall. He was talking to the wall because he wasn't talking to her. He wasn't listening. It doesn't mean he wasn't cognitively listening. He had her all figured out. Cut loose, he didn't know her. And the kicker is wisdom is intuitive. He needs all the other things that go with it, including rationality, obviously. Not right. But if you don't have the actual humility of the heart, you're never going to be wise. You may be smart, but you won't be wise. I, I can add to that. I mean, in the in the uh, we have these uh, syna many synagogues have scholar and residence uh, programs, and uh, when people come for a Shabbat and uh, they give a couple of presentations, and one of the things is that that you see very clearly with some speakers is the ability to connect to the people, even if they're not giving something as rigorously presented as someone else. And uh, it, it becomes a way, you know, they have this ability to touch people and to get through to them far more than somebody would get through on an on intellectual level. I don't think it's any listening. It creates surprise. Yeah. It's just five. Yeah. It's not an argument. It's a story. Yeah. It's all that a narrative. So what does it do? I heard this from the Valley Access many years ago, back in Europe, 1980, actually. He got the philosopher, I don't know, remember his name. He was from Tel Aviv. He was talking about the Passover, how you enter into the gate of entering into the narrative. That's what you want. You're entering into the story. Now, wisdom, in a way, is the entering of the story of humankind. And I would say, I push this one on. It's the best of dialogue between God and Abraham, God and Moses, David, the prophets. It's a conversation. Sometimes hostile, sometimes challenging, but always interesting. <laughs> yes, the story of humankind. It's a story, but it's a story that is full of meaning, more than more than our philosophies. To be honest about it, far more. I think so easily. If God made a philosophy, you haven't really made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why there's such a, a large audience now for uh, for writings about the Bible. I mean, uh, you know, academics works are out there, interpretive works. And they're very, they're read by a lot of people. They're very deep. As you say, the stories are a better way. We just talked about this some before. The narrative 
is a better way. I think we, we were discussing this, that it gets issues across much better, it gets people to think more, to see it more vividly. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't disagree. Even as a Talmudist, that's because there's this whole other side to Judaism. We got the Midrash and things like that. Look how many stories you guys told yeah. <laughs> the best part is you know, the stories. Yeah. So I wanted to go back to um, some people and that uh, the line to uh, the and what the skeptical what the skeptical might be doing is something like this. Look, okay, maybe the why question is maybe even in principle and answerable or it's the wrong question to ask, or but I feel like I need to give the person who's asking that question right. some story as to even why that's the wrong question, or why it's an answer, or um, in a way that it's just not shifting the topic. And not, I, and I, I guess my question is, is that something that's desirable to respond in that way? And how would we go about doing that? Maybe it's not through writing. It's through a narrative, or but it's a way of not rushing off the question. Yes, I, 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 yeah. That, that, that's, I think that's a very good. That's a very helpful insight. Um, that in the continental field, it's sort of like don't ask this. Instead, let's move into this. And what you're saying is, you know, I'm not brushing you off, but let's look and let's look at the arguments, and we'll see that there's some sort of a fallacy in moving from God exists to therefore there isn't a lot of evil. And maybe, maybe, and that's that's where the rational. Part. See, usually you think of the the, um, uh, the continental philosophers, usually the ones who sort of tap into the psyche, right, tap into our consciousness, but for certain sorts of personalities, the skeptical theist approach is better because you're, you're, you're talking the same language, right? You're talking the language of argument. And so I, I, think, I think what you, what you said is very helpful here, that yeah, you're relating better to what the, que to what the question was. Right? I think that's good. So I think when um, we're discussing humility, there's often a confusion between two senses of smallness or lowness or something like that. So if you're standing on a mountain and like looking at the world or something, you can think like, wow, I'm, I'm really small. I'm just like a tiny part of this big world that's beautiful. Um, but I think that sense is compatible with like, I'm special, but I'm a small, special part of everything. And then there's this other sense, which I hear, I guess, in Christian theology, like I am a sinner, I'm really bad. It's not only that I'm a small part of something, but I really suck. Um, <laughs> and I'm lucky that anybody, I mean, that's kind of maybe exaggerating, but I, I do hear things like that. And so, um, I don't know, I guess I'm asking if you guys think either of these concepts are compatible with, or necessary, or opposed to humility. Do you mean loneliness? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. But loneliness. The filthy, dirty pile of sin, lowly, right? Yeah, yeah. If either of them would be part of humility or not. They both are, in a way. Yeah. I thought you said neither. You said loneliness isn't a part of your humility. No, no, no. no. I, it's not the way I find it attractive to think about humility, but that's not to say I, th I think it's... Maybe I'm going back to Catherine? Kathleen? Catherine. Catherine. Um, that I can hear it, so to speak. I mean, I, if somebody says, I have a picture of human, humanity as fallen, um, I, can, uh, I understand how they're taking humility. That's okay. I was saying I don't find it very attractive myself in terms of my own, uh, right? Uh, so I, I, when I said both, I meant both can be, why wouldn't I like the other one? Well, well that's what I'm asking, because you, I heard you maybe a misunderstood, but I thought mm -hmm. you said, Lowness isn't any part, or maybe you're talking about awe. Oh, well, lowness isn't any part of what I'm no, doing. No, no, so no. I'm wondering it is, if the it is, second it, lowness or is part of uh, the smallness. If just being small it? and not being bad is. I don't know. I mean, one thing that happened to me today is that I became sensitive to this question because of what you said. 
I'm not sure what the small, the role the smallness is playing mm -hmm. now. I want to think about that some more. Um, right. Uh, I'm not sure small and low go together. So, I mean, in fact, it might work at some mm -hmm. point the opposite way. You might think, you know, given what David said about the world having, you know, I'm a tiny so piece people, of this, yeah. and yet I'm conscious and I feel things. What a what a what an amazing thing that is, you, you, you know. Yeah, you know, there's a the word lowly conjures up. I mean, for a lot of people, for myself, you know, some sort of depressed state, right? Some sort of feeling that you're lowly. But I, I think that the philosophers who don't see, who don't think that that sort of feeling is, uh, I mean, the, the philosophers who would talk about the importance of uh, feeling low aren't necessarily talking about that. In other words, right. yes, uh, some writers are. You can have a kind of abstract sense of uh, sense of lowliness. Like I know that in the big picture, I am one out of how many people there are in the world, and that's it. So I have an intellectual apprehension about it, but it doesn't get me down all day. There are moments when it, you know, when you feel it, but but for the most part, the, the loneliness and believing you are low are not the same thing. Well, feeling low and believing believing you are low it doesn't have to have emotional valence. I think. Although in religious traditions, it very often does. I mean, the idea is you're supposed to flagellate yourself and so forth, you castigate yourself, but, but it doesn't have to have the emotional balance, I don't think. Uh, Eleanor, do you want to comment on this? Because well, I, I feel I sort of... Know, I don't know how you could... Um, tell how they would get that idea, but I certainly did. I was thinking I should intervene, but I really want to. <laughs> See, I guess this, uh, your question is uh, very like the question I tried to ask how earlier, where I felt I like wasn't really communicating but there's, um, um, when Holly talks about awe and humility, the thing that strikes me as different about the way he talks about it from the way other people talk about it is that you can hear at the same time two things going on in his terms, in his mode of presentation. On the one hand, there's this sense of um, seeing something else as vast or magnificent or something, where the, the terms have to do with bigness, and the bigness is on the side of that, and by comparison with that, you, the observer, feeling the magnificence of that are small. It is a thing that it doesn't lead to a sense of depression, humiliation, low self-esteem. It, it will lead to exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. Exaltation, exaltation, a kind of sense of wanting to, I don't know, burst into song of creation or something. Way how so there's a sense of aloneness that goes with uh, an exalted spirit that is encompassing all of the people or something. And I thought that was what was distinctive about the way how he was talking about all the humility. So there you have both lowness and smallness, but they go with the very opposite of humiliation. They go with the sense of, of being part of grandeur and glory in a way that brings joy and not depression. So that, I, I get a hold of it, kind of, um, with the Grand Canyon or standing out in space or on top of a mountain. I'm not sure I get a hold of it in terms of uh, great music or great art, whether, whether it produces a smallness feeling. I just want to think about it some more. A comment about Islam really quick on here, because, I mean, you had the, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. You had the, the smallest one is, you know, a small part of a much larger thing. The other one, the idea of bad, and um, at least with within Islam, um, there's there's not a theory of the fall. Uh, humans are not seen as inherently bad, or and here's the important part: in need, particularly of redemption. Um, and so, when you think in terms of Christianity and stuff, where the redemption story plays a, a very important part, it's not there in in, in Islam. So, um, I mean. God is merciful and compassionate, that's great, but it's not that we need to be redeemed because we're somehow or another inherently bad. That's one of the important things I, I got from today because I'm, I guess, most familiar with the Christian tradition is I didn't hear anybody talk about, at least not very much, how our badness or our need for that sort of salvation, which is something that I've always kind of heard in this discussion of humility before, so... Yeah, and, and so I, I am mean, decidedly missing. So I feel like, um, David, tell me if this feels right. 
I feel like uh, in our tradition, it's more like the world needs redemption. As opposed to the individual? Yeah. It depends who you read. Uh, yeah. like, like Rabbi Soloveitchik has the exact opposite movement. In other words, he's more interested in the inner redemption than the outer redemption. Uh, that's also coming out of phenomenology. You know, mm -hmm. he's interested in religious phenomenology rather than the rather than the external. But but the talk, but that's new. The news, the talk yeah. about redemption of the individual yeah. is relatively new. It actually starts with, with Hasidism as a psych, mm -hmm. psychologizing certain concepts right. Right. that they're not external events. But there, there is something, you know, there, there is but something true there. the world certainly needs it's redemption. Very true that, yeah, the expression, you know, a person being redeemed as an individual yeah. doesn't doesn't occur you know, in classical mm -hmm. sources. I think with these words from the panel, we should quit because we have been for a long time today. I think we're going to, there's marvelous food out there. Stay a little bit, talk to the speakers, eat a little something. Thank you for coming. But thank you especially to uh, all three. Thank you, Barbara, for being part of this. I really appreciate it a whole lot, having you as part of the team. Really appreciate the perspectives you brought, and I hope that this will be very useful for the work of the uh, assembled here, the temple project. So please join me in thanking our panel.